Have you ever found yourself at Schmeekly Reserve and seen an injured animal and wondered what should I do about it? Or perhaps you've been walking along the trails and off in the distance you see a bird that's unable to fly? Or maybe you find yourself at Lake Joannis, which is where I am right now, and you see an abandoned duckling and you don't know who to call. Hi, my name is Emma and I am an interpreter here at Schmeekly Reserve. So if you've said yes to any of those questions or have had other experiences at Schmeekly or at home with injured or abandoned animals, then you've found yourself in the right video. Today, we're gonna cover those questions and hopefully answer any other questions you might have about injured or abandoned animals. So let's get to it. All right, so during this video, I'm gonna be asking a couple questions, and those are just to get those wheels turning and help you to kind of visualize, and think about any experiences that you've heard of or had yourself when dealing with wild critters. So feel free to pause the video and give yourself time to think through those questions and answer them how you would. So we're gonna start by talking about some basic safety protocols for any situation when dealing with wild critters. So. The first question is, what of your own questions pop in your mind when you're thinking about safety and handling wild critters? All right, so some things that you might have thought about could include, what should I be wearing when handling wild critters? Perhaps you're wondering what kind of animal it might be, how dangerous the animal might be, or how the animal might be injured. What precautions or safety measures should I take? That's definitely one that I think about quite often. Or you could be thinking, what diseases might the animal have and who should I call to get more information? Those are all fantastic questions and hopefully I'll be answering those throughout the program. Anything that you might have a question about, feel free to add those to the comments below and we'll try and answer them later on. So no matter the situation, there are a few safety precautions that should be taken into um, regard no matter what. The first of these is going to be safety clothing. So the major one that should be worn no matter what your animal you're dealing with is going to be gloves. So gloves are a really a barrier that keep both the animal and the human safe all at once. And work gloves are generally what we're going to consider safe to use. So that's going to be anything that's leather or hardened. So generally, you're not going to want to wear cloth gloves. Although when you're dealing with a baby animal, sometimes cloth gloves could be enough. Another recommendation that I'm going to suggest is wearing long sleeves and something that might be a little thicker material like the Schmeekly sweatshirt that I'm wearing right now. So this is going to keep your arms from getting scratches or potentially having those animals rub up on you that might be diseased. So those are some basic protocol. Another thing that you could take into consideration is what are you wearing on your legs? Generally wearing jeans or another pair of long, thicker material on your legs is going to be better. However, generally you're not going to be dealing with more dangerous animals and we'll get into that in just a second. So sometimes it's okay to not really worry about what you're wearing on your legs because Again, if you're going to be interacting with more dangerous animals, you're going to want to take more precautions. And sometimes you'll even want to just call a specialist. So the next thing to consider, no matter the situation, is going to be how dangerous is the animal? So this, the answer to this question can really affect how we're going to deal with the rest of the situation. And most wild critters, we're going to just categorize in two categories. So that's going to be very dangerous animals and less dangerous animals. And so for the rest of the program, we're really gonna be talking about animals in those two categories. So let's continue by talking about which animals should go into which category. I've made a little bit of a slideshow to show you um, what traits and what animals could fall into that the more dangerous category. And so I'm just gonna pop on over there and show you what that looks like right now. So, very dangerous critters. You might be wondering, how do I know if they're dangerous? What makes one critter more dangerous than another? So let's talk about that. 
So this first picture is a picture of a raptor, which is a type of bird or a category of birds that um, are hunting their prey. So they are predators. And so being predators, they need some specialized traits that help them to capture their prey and eat their prey. So the first trait that we're going to talk about is talons. So big, sharp claws on birds that are going to be really dangerous. They're either going to be really, really, really sharp, and so they can stab or they can rip and they can tear things away, and they're usually going to be really strong as well. Um, the next trait on raptors that we want to be really careful about is going to be their beaks. So they have sharp, strong, tearing beaks, and those are also going to be really dangerous to us as humans. Now the next animal that has some traits that could be dangerous to us um, is going to be one that you've probably seen a lot if you've ever gone to Schmeekly Reserve, and that is the white-tailed deer. As you can see, this is a male white-tailed deer, and this guy has some pretty cool features, but also some dangerous ones. So as you can see, he does have big antlers. That is what those horns are called at the top of a deer's head, which I've highlighted for you here. And those, if the animal feels um, threatened or aggressive, they can definitely do some damage to you with those. Another thing you want to be careful of is deer have really powerful legs. Those muscles can put a lot of oomph behind a kick. So you want to be really careful if you're ever going to engage a deer because they can definitely take you on. This is a picture of a badger. And badgers, I don't think I've ever seen one in or around Schmeekly Reserve. However, I thought it was fitting to add them because they are all over Wisconsin. And so badgers are really, really dangerous critters. They are very ferocious. And to go along with their, um, their attitude, which is really aggressive, they also have really sharp, sharp claws and long claws. So you don't want to get into a, a tearing match with these guys. They also have really, really sharp teeth. So again, be careful if you're ever going to see one of these. Um, it's probably best to avoid them. This next one, they look pretty, pretty harmless, right? This is a raccoon, and he's a pretty cute raccoon, hanging out, staring, watching something happen. Um, but while maybe not dangerous in the most common of ways, he probably doesn't have the sharpest claws or the most tearing bite. But they are often called trash pandas for a reason because they do carry a lot of diseases. And so we want to be careful when we're interacting with them because a lot of the diseases they might be carrying are transferable to humans, mainly rabies and some other um, diseases that we really don't want to be getting from them. So again, these are going to be on the very dangerous list because they do carry some diseases that are transferable to humans. This last picture really encompasses both coyotes and wolves because any animal in the canine family, we're going to want to be really careful around. They have um, a really strong ability to sense when they are in danger. And so if you are going to come up to them or you're even trying to help them, they might just lash out at you. And they have really, really strong jaws as well. Those tearing teeth and sharp claws you really do not want to be on the other end of. So that is why we're going to be careful with these critters. They are on the very dangerous list. And so if you ever come across an animal that has those sharp teeth, those tearing claws or talons or beaks, or an animal that might have lots of different types of diseases, you're going to want to be really careful. So those are some of the traits I wanted to really bring out to you and show you that animals with those kinds of characteristics, um, the best approach is going to actually be to call a wildlife specialist immediately. And so I've added those links to the description in case you ever find yourself needing them. And so instead of actually engaging them yourself, it's best to just call a wildlife rehabilitator or specialist in the area that can come and take care of that animal. If you find them trapped or stuck in any way, do not engage them, please, because it is never, there's never really a good reason for you to put yourself in harm's way to help another creature, because this can actually escalate the situation to a point where there is no longer just one critter with a problem. Instead, 
you're adding yourself to the list, and that just makes two people or animals that need help. All right, so animals that are a lot smaller and lack many of those traits that we just talked about are going to be animals that pose less risk to us. So examples of animals that we can do a lot more to help are going to be songbirds, rabbits, ducks, chipmunks, squirrels, frogs, and salamanders, and animals that are more of that caliber or um, rating. So things that pose a little bit less risk to us. However, these animals are still dangerous and can pose risks to us. So we still want to make sure we're taking those safety precautions really seriously. Put on those gloves, don that sweatshirt, and make sure that you're wearing long pants and boots because you want to make sure that you're covering yourself to keep us safe and to keep the animal itself safe as well. So now that we kind of know what some safety precautions are, how we should be handling those really very risky animals, and what classifies less risky animals, let's go ahead and delve into what we can do when we do encounter an animal that poses us less, less risk. So to do that, why don't you take a moment and go ahead and consider some questions or comments or concerns you might have when and if you do come in contact with an injured or sick animal and think about what you might ask yourself. So some of the things that you might have thought about or considered could have included things like, should I call for help? Should I pick the critter up? Do I need to grab first aid and bandage them? Are they thirsty or hungry? What should I do in this situation? And who can I call for more information? These are fantastic questions. And so we're gonna start off by answering, what do you do in this circumstance? What's the first step? So the first step is always, no matter whether the animal is injured or ill, you should be documenting where you found the animal. So in this circumstance, we're pretending we're at Lake Jonas in Schmeekley Reserve. And so what you would do is you would kind of look around, figure out exactly where you are, what's all over the ground, where you found the animal, whether or not there's a bench nearby perhaps, or what kinds of trees are around this area. This allows the wildlife rehabilitator to better understand the situation, and it also allows them to potentially reintroduce the animal into a, a habitat similar or the same habitat as where they were found. So, it may be necessary to call a wildlife rehabilitator before engaging with the animal, depending on the situation. If the injury that the animal sustained seems serious enough, so say that they look like they are really struggling, or the animal is unresponsive when you poke it or try and get it to move, or perhaps the animal seems highly disoriented. So if it's waddling around, kind of like not able to fly when you come close to it, or it doesn't seem like it's able to move away from you, or if it's just kind of like staying in one place for a long time, not doing what a normal bird or other animal, mammal, might look like it should be doing on a normal basis. And if you're not sure what that looks like, go ahead and just call a wildlife specialist right away. However, if the animal's injury or illness seems less extreme, or if the animal seems like it's in an unsafe area where it might not be able to fend for itself and predators are a worry, we can gently remove this animal from the area that we found it, putting it in a cardboard box making sure that we're wearing gloves and those long sleeves and anything else that we think might help us to stay safe. And then we can call a wildlife rehabilitator for more information. Birds are a little bit of a different case. Caring for a bird at home or waiting to take them to a vet can harm the bird more and even be illegal. The first step is to notify Schmeekly staff and then Reggie. So what is Reggie? Reggie is the Raptor Education Group Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization. And these, these guys are located in Antigo, which is about one and a half hours drive northeast of Schmeekley Reserve. Reggie has certified specialists who really know what they're doing when it comes to birds and helping birds. And so after you have talked to Reggie on the phone, they may have more information about how to go about helping the specific bird, but you can definitely prepare a cardboard box with holes in them 
or a bird for the bird. Then place a towel in the box and you can place the bird in the box as well. It's very important that you don't put bird feed, worms, insects, or water in the box unless given spe special instructions to do so by Reggie or another wildlife specialist. When handling birds, safety is the most important thing. So helping a hurt bird is a really noble act, but it can be dangerous. Remember that raptors fall into the very dangerous category. However, because raptors are more often than not protected and are a sensitive animal type, they are the one exception to when it comes to dealing with very dangerous animals. So actually for raptors, sometimes there's more you can do instead of just calling a wildlife specialist or a wildlife rehabilitation center. If you feel you are able to do so, you may actually be able to help these birds and transport them to a nearby wildlife rehab center. Now it's really important that you do call Reggie or another agency before you engage with raptors. These species should be considered on the very dangerous category and thus you need to make, make sure you're taking all of those safety precautions and more. If and when you are given the go ahead by an agency that is um, specializes in taking care of raptors or other wildlife, then it may be time to, be, to engage with this animal and actually go ahead and help them. So in order to help these species, I'm going to demonstrate how to engage a raptor when you come across one in the evening. <laughs> oh look, a raptor that looks injured. I should help him. Wait, stop. <laughs> Before interacting with an injured raptor, there are five steps that you should take to ensure your safety and the raptor's safety. So remember, the reason that raptors are so dangerous to us is that they have that big beak for tearing and those really, really sharp talons. So what are those five steps? Well, the first one is place. The reason that you should consider the place is so that a wildlife rehabilitator knows what environment the animal is found in in order to reintroduce them if they're able to. Another reason is that they can help the critter a little bit better if they know what environment they came from. So for this critter, that area is going to be around Lake Jonas here at Schmeekley Reserve. The next step in our sequence is flank. So flanking means coming from behind. And so for this one, you're making sure that you have that piece of cloth we talked about. And you're just gonna come around and make sure that you're coming from behind. So for these animals, remember, they have sharp beaks and sharp talons. So you don't want those pointed at you. Also, when you're coming from behind, it makes sure that the animal itself is feeling a little bit less threatened, um, especially if it is injured. So the next step in this sequence is going to be position. And this is really just talking about the position of your hands and also the position, the position of the animal in the box. So as we begin to flank the critter, we're gonna make sure that we are watching where those talons are. Once we have covered them gently, we're going to grab them by their legs, making sure that we're really sure where that, those talons are. Also, we're going to grab them around the chest area and that ensures that we know where the beak is and the beak can't get to our hands or our arms. Then we're going to gently lift them by those two places and we're going to move them over to a box that we've already gathered. So when you're thinking about putting them in the box, you wanna make sure that you have them situated a little bit gently and the box that you have, you should make sure it's tall enough that the animal can stand up in it. Now don't remove the blanket Keeping the blanket in there with them is kind of keeps them a little calmer. It's a softer material. And then you can just close the box up and you're ready to move them. Now, when thinking about doing all of these things, that's where the fifth step comes in. The fifth step is care. So you wanna be really gentle when you're caring for raptors. Although many of them are really big birds, a lot bigger than the one that I just showed you. Um, but they are also really, really sensitive. So their wings and their bones, you wanna make sure that you're being really gentle when you're handling them. That includes when you're moving them. So if possible, you wanna make sure that you're taking 
these animals to your vehicle and hopefully you'll have a second person there who can hold them as you transport them to a wildlife rehabilitator. However, if you don't have someone else with you, then it's okay to set these in the back or between seats and make sure that they are propped safely so that they're not moving around and you don't give the bird a concussion. So that's all I have for you. We're going to head back over to the rest of the program. All right, so hopefully that demonstration cleared up any questions you might have when it comes to dealing with an injured raptor species. So now that we've thought about how we're going to handle injured and ill critters that we find either in the wild or near our home, we're going to go ahead and swap over and think a little bit about what we would do in a situation where we find an abandoned critter. The first thing that we want to consider is whether the infant is in any way injured. If it is, then it's time to call a wildlife rehabilitator or specialist. Do not take the animal to a shelter or a vet. This requires specialized care. Cassandra Pio is the nearest wildlife rehabilitator with the DNR. She is located in Wisconsin Rapids. I have added her contact information to the description of this video in case you ever need to contact her. So, if the young animal is not injured, then the next thing to consider is, are they actually abandoned? Much of the time when we find a young animal, it's not actually abandoned. There are lots of things to consider before deciding to continue with abandoned animal protocols. It's important that an that we remember that an animal's best chance for survival is with their mother. This gives them the best chance at survival in the wild. Thus, it is crucial that the young be monitored in case a mother returns. If they do not, then reuniting them may be necessary. With larger animals, such as fawns or baby deer, it's best to leave them alone. It's most likely that their mother or another of their species is not far away, and taking them out of that situation is going to do more harm than it will help. So let's take a moment and consider what other questions we might ask in a situation where we feel like an infant has been abandoned. These are questions that I want you to think about um, before you're going to remove the infant from an area and before you start um, actually handling infants at all. So some of the things that you might have thought about could have been what kind of animal is it? Is there any sign of their home nearby? Have I seen um, the animal with its mother lately? So this could be for kits or young foxes and their mothers. So perhaps you may have seen a kit running around with its mother just a few days prior, but now you see the kits running around on their own. Or perhaps you're wondering how you can find out whether the animal is abandoned or not. Depending on the type of critter, there are a few things that can be done to assess the situation. If it's a ground-dwelling species, like the picture I just put up of baby rabbits, perhaps you're thinking chipmunks, or other things like we said before, foxes are another one that could be something you're thinking about. So the first thing you want to do is look for a nest nearby. If you do find a nest, you can return the baby to that nest and then wait about 24 hours to see if the mother returns. To do this, you're going to go ahead and sprinkle flour, like this one, yes, all purpose, or any kind of flour, really, around the edges of the nest. If there are footprints from the mother within that 24 hour time span, then it's time to leave the nest alone because those animals are in a safe situation. However, if there are no footprints around the nest, it's time to call a specialist and follow their recommendations. Now, if you can't find a nest, then there are some other options that you could follow. For most infant critters, it's unlikely that they are far from their nest, because generally what has happened is the mother has either taken them from their old nest and is trying to return them to a new one, or they were snatched by a predator, and for some reason, the predator didn't get around to eating them. So what you can do is you can take those baby animals and move them into a basket. Generally, a basket that has a closing mechanism that isn't like a latch or some other way that an animal couldn't open it. This allows the mother to come back 
and safely grab the imprints from that basket and move them. Again, you can put flour around the edges of that basket and see if the animal comes to take them away. Um, it's not super necessary, but if you are good at like, paw printing, you can see what animal did come. Otherwise, you can just put a video camera on the basket and monitor the situation. So for other animals like baby squirrels and things that might not be ground dwelling animals, you can still put them in a basket and set it beneath a tree. This will allow squirrels or other animals to feel safer and they're able to come to the basket and remove them just like with other critters, but being near a tree can make them feel a little more safe and give them a little more of a chance to get to that basket and keep the mother from feeling stressed. Again, you wanna make sure that you're handling these babies with gloves on, not your bare hands, because you don't wanna get your scent on them and also they could be carrying diseases. So if the mother does not return and retrieve her babies, then it's time to scoop them up, put them in a cardboard box with a fluffy blanket on the bottom and call a specialist before doing anything else with them. Again, it's best to call a specialist because for one, you don't always know what to feed that critter. And even if you do, there might be complications involved. So calling a specialist and getting some more information before moving forward is always going to be the best option. Remember, there's never a reason to put yourself in harm's way. And if you're uncertain what species the critter it is or what to do with a baby, then definitely call that wildlife specialist. It's against the law to keep a wild animal if you don't have the proper license or permit, even if you plan to release them. By law, you must get the animal to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator within 24 hours of taking them in. So now that we've worked together to understand the best ways of caring for injured and abandoned critters, perhaps you're thinking about your own past experiences or perhaps stories that you've heard about with injured or abandoned critters. So if there's any questions or stories that you'd like to share with us, feel free to drop those in the comment section and we'll do our best to answer them. As always, we absolutely love hearing from our visitors and the stories that you share or questions that you share can help inform others as well as all of us at Schmeekly Reserve. Hopefully this virtual program answered some of your questions or related to experiences that you've had for more information on any of the content covered in this program, feel free to refer to the links in the description below. Contact information for the nearest wildlife rehabilitator in the Stevens Point Clover area, the DNR, and the Raptor Education Group Incorporated has also been added and can be found in the description. Thank you for watching this episode of Virtual Interpretation at Schmeekly Reserve. And as always, we can't wait to see you in the next videos. Bye.